Welcome back to the Warts and All podcast. I'm Susie Edge, medical doctor and historian, and I'm just fascinated by how we've treated the human body in life and in death. But let's face it, mostly in death. Do we need music? Do you think? I just, I never got round to adding music to the podcast. I, I don't know. You tell me. So what's been going on? This is wonderful. I have been sent a cover for Mortal Monarchs, my book, which will be out later this year. That's so that I can do a cover reveal video uh, next week. I took a sneaky peek picture of that, so my patrons over at patreon.com slash Edge can join in the fun. I'm not going to lie, I let out a little squeal when it came through the post. Mortal Monarchs, A Thousand Years of Royal Deaths is available for pre-order. If you're interested in that, then the links are in the bios on my website. Uh, all those places where you find me, there'll be a link to that. The publishers are telling me that they're very happy with the number of pre-orders already in. So if you've done that, I appreciate it so much. Thank you. I've had some wonderful messages of support lately. Kurt messaged saying that he was a fan from the colonies. <laughs> he said, I enjoy your work and the science and informative aspects of your TikToks and podcasts. I really love seeing these messages and comments like this. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. Kurt is a Patreon supporter. And as ever, I have a massive thank you for my supporters on Patreon. I think about you all the time, your generosity and your genuine desire for me, the podcast, the videos and the book to do well is so lovely. Uh, recently joining us on Patreon was Kurt, Lisa, Jen, Jenna and Kathy. You guys rock and I will put my cover reveal on there first for you to see it next week. I'm having far too much fun doing all of this, aren't I? The podcast is doing really well. I've had uh, well over 20,000 downloads in, in 10 episodes. That's just on the podcast stream. There's been many, many more on YouTube as well. So do you think it's about time I found a sponsor for the podcast? Mm -hmm. If you think that your company might be a good fit, then give me a shout and we can have a chat about that. I'd, uh, I'd love to hear from you. OK, shall we move on to today's podcast? What gift would you send to your average, friendly, European historical monarch? This one is about the power of the unicorn horn. OK, I hear you. It doesn't sound much like human body history, but there is a link, honestly. And it's a link that's lasted over a thousand years. Because unicorn horns, or alicorns, were thought to be purifying, and that's why they were important to the human body. In writings from 400 BC, it was recorded that princes would use drinking goblets made of unicorn horns to protect themselves against poisoning, there was no evidence that it actually worked, but we don't want to let the facts get in the way of bling. Now, these writings, even if they were the fiction of the day, had influence for years. I mean, other parts of the unicorn could come in handy too, apparently. A leather belt could protect against plague and fevers. We really could do with the help of a leather unicorn belt today, huh? And shoes made of unicorn leather could specifically protect the lucky owner from diseases of the feet and legs. The abbess Hildegard of Bingen suggested in the 12th century that ointments of unicorn's liver and egg yolks could ward off leprosy. It was in the 14th century, revived and gathering pace, stories of the healing powers of unicorn horn took hold. And drinking from unicorn horn goblets or drinking actual powdered unicorn horn, well, the healing powers of that was much sought after. Andrea Bacci wrote a book in 1573, The Treaty of the Unicorn, Its Wonderful Properties and Its Use. And here's me worrying about fact-checking for my book. Interestingly, he had patients who were major investors in the unicorn horn trade. Nothing really changes then, huh? Anyone who was someone sought unicorn horns for protection and status, and the horns became legendary. Queen Elizabeth I, Queen of England in the 16th century, ever worried about being poisoned by rivals, even though she was smothering her own face in poison daily. I mean, she would buy a unicorn horn that today, well, that from a bank account today would cost millions of pounds. A gift made to Queen Elizabeth by the Arctic explorer Martin Frobisher was so wonderful that the Queen requested it be preserved with the British crown jewels. 
and European monarchs became a bit obsessed with owning unicorn horns. Ivan the Terrible had a staff made from a unicorn horn. It didn't protect him against the stroke that he had, playing a peaceful game of chess with a friend. An eight-foot-long specimen on display at the museum in Bruges was said to have been gifted to Charlemagne. When Francis I of France had a horn gifted to him by the Pope, he had it mounted in solid gold. Philip II of Spain had twelve of them he didn't hold back, and nor did Christian V of Denmark, who had a throne made out of them for him to sit on. It's like Game of Thrones. They were so sought after that they could fetch several times their weight in gold. Thomas de Torquemada, the Grand Inquisitor, he would travel nowhere without a bag of powdered unicorn horn for protection. There were some people, though, who were not convinced. Ambrose Paré, the 16th century surgeon to the French king, saw the use of unicorn horn in the highest palaces. He wrote that dishes of alicorn would be used to serve up food to the kings. If the dishes started to smoke and become hot, then poison was surely present. But Paré wasn't so sure. Paré wrote his book, A Discourse on the Unicorn, in 1582, when he was 72 years old. He dedicated it to one of his patients, the knight, Des Ursins. Des Ursins had asked Paré why, when treating him for an injury, Paré had not used traditional remedies of mummified human flesh in honey or powdered unicorn horn. And this was his response. Paré even questioned the very existence of unicorns. I do not believe, he said, in the existence of unicorns, and therefore the remedy of the horn, of the unicorn, cannot be real. And he wasn't alone. Christophe Landré, uh, Guillaume Rondelet, Jean Divet all questioned the healing powers of horns. But Paré got a lot of criticism for his beliefs. His position at the French court made him a target too. The dean of the medical schools in Paris, a Mr Grangier, was super critical of Paré. He told him to focus on surgery, where his true skills were, rather than undermining the work of the apothecaries. He basically told Paré to stay in his own lane. Paré replied that just because something had been used and believed for a long time is not enough to prove that the unicorn has the virtues attributed to it. I'm beginning to really like Ambrose Paré. The King James VI of Scotland, who was also James I of England, was not so much sceptical of the power of unicorn horn, but he wanted to make sure that he hadn't been sold a dud. So he tested it. He ground up some poison and fed it to a servant. And as the servant became ill, he gave him the antidote. But the servant died. Though there was probably a lot of fake powdered and chipped horn going about. I mean, you would, wouldn't you? You, you? you could just go off and grind something random and sell it to an apothecary for lots of money. The real thing came, of course, not from unicorns. That would be silly and slightly surprising. But they were narwhal husks. The narwhal, also known as the narwhale, is an arctic whale that has a huge tusk. Actually, it's a canine tooth that beautifully twists out ahead of it, and that can grow up to half the length of the whale. They live in the freezing waters of the Arctic around Canada, Greenland, Russia. It's mostly the males who have the wonderful distinctive helical tusk. And when washed up on shores, it's easy to imagine how anyone might think of, of such a thing as being magical. The tusks are hollow and can weigh around 10 kilograms or 22 pounds, and they can be up to nine feet long. For the narwhal, they're not for stabbing prey. It's probably more likely a sensory organ, but also with it being mostly the males who have the tusks, it's thought that they are like stag's antlers, for instance, a sign of male prowess. It was the tusk of the narwhal that was passed off as the healing unicorn horn for centuries. It was Vikings moving about the northern waters who cashed in on it. They would trade them and do very, very well out of rich believers. And it wasn't in their interest to go telling anyone where the horns were coming from. But Soon more exploration, more science, more people figured out that these were coming from narwhals. After Paré and the others started to question the healing powers of horns, they started to become less sought after. But of course, there are still many who will look for tusks and horns, believing in their powers. 
rhino being slaughtered for aphrodisiac properties of their horns is still happening. We might not believe in unicorns, but animals we know to exist are still in danger. So it's probably not wise to look back on the believers in unicorn horns and scoff. Wait, I just had a thought. You know how people like to point out that Vikings never had horns on their helmets? That this came from an opera and it became popular belief? Well, maybe one of them did try it, but then they realised they could make a ton of riches. Hey, I could ground up my helmet horn and pass it off as unicorn horn. Not a phrase I thought I'd ever say in public, to be honest. Okay, so unless we hop on a research vessel to the Arctic, best place to see a unicorn horn, oh, sorry, a narwhal tusk, is probably in a museum. There's loads of them. I've recently seen a few in the wonderful Maritime Museum in the city of Hull. I'm guessing there are many more. They are beautiful things. It really is no surprise that finding one was a, a magical thing, and it's no surprise that they were attributed with magical powers. We still believe in the weird and wonderful, but not in unicorns. Actually, I, when I was looking up some things to make to write this podcast about unicorn horns, one of the top searches that came out with the word unicorn on Google was, do unicorns still exist? The most interesting thing about that question is the word still, because that suggests that they once did. Well, maybe they still do. Maybe they do. Maybe it's us that are wrong. Who knows? Thank you for listening to the Warts and All podcast, weird and wonderful human body histories. This episode will be on YouTube as a podcast, but I'm going to make it into a video with pictures and, you know, chat and more. So please do subscribe and keep an eye out for that. I've uploaded a video about the brutal beheading of Margaret Pohl and had some fab comments about that one. That's my first YouTube specific video. So, yep, you can find me on YouTube, on Instagram as edge.suze. Say hi on Twitter at Suzy Edge. I will be giving a sneaky peek of the Mortal Monarchs cover reveal on Patreon for supporters there. And as ever, I upload history content, discussion and chat on TikTok at Suzy Edge. There are amazingly over 200,000 like-minded, weird and wonderful followers on there. On TikTok this week, we've discussed Mary Boleyn's death, or rather our lack of any information on her death and burial. We've had more on Richard III and the princes in the tower, and we've looked at Marie Antoinette's extreme dentistry. And we went for a walk up Prince Charles's bum, so to speak. We looked at the mystery of the miniature coffins found in Arthur's seat above Edinburgh. And also, this might be useful, there's a video I made about historical fiction where loads of people have left some really good suggestions and recommendations in the comments section if you're looking for historical fiction to keep going through the winter months. Thank you all for, for joining in on that one. Tomorrow I'm taking a trip to visit the battlefield at Culloden. I want to have a think about how the dead were treated there. Uh, so there'll be more to follow on that and hopefully some videos as well. So... This has been the Warts and All podcast, written and produced by me, Susie Edge, with artwork by Catherine Edge, and we'll see you soon.